The first true sequel to what would become one of the biggest gaming franchises of all time. Released in late 1999 on PlayStation and DOS and then on Dreamcast in mid-2000, respect is everything, as shown in the live-action introduction to the game. What we're seeing here is a montage of clips taken from the GTA 2 movie. Yeah, to promote the game, Rockstar made an 8-minute short film for advertising. That is so damn cool. We're a good 20 or so years removed from this, and still, it's never been replicated throughout any of the games since, making this quite a unique opening to what would go on to be one of the most unique entries in the franchise, as we'll discover in good time. This movie plays out more like an action music video, but I really like that. It's punchy and to the point, relying on visual storytelling and references that become more understanded once we start playing the game. Now, despite owning the PS1 version of the game myself, I decided to get the best experience possible with the original DOS version. So while the PS1 port takes place entirely during the daytime, the Dreamcast version on the other hand takes place entirely at night, which is really odd. I mean, this has a very pretty, yet ominous and threatening vibe to it, but this is too dark to play an entire game through. And coming off of the original, the top-down perspective is disorienting enough, even when you can see clearly. Thankfully, on the PC version, we can select between these two options at our own leisure, but for the sake of this video being watchable, I'll be sticking with daytime, just so we can see what's going on. And at first glance, man, this is a nice looking game. The detail in textures and sprites have been greatly improved, and while it still has its moments, the camera does a much better job of keeping up with the player without inducing motion sickness. Otherwise, at its core, this is the same game as before. Earn enough points any way you please by completing missions or odd jobs around the map to advance onto the next stage. This game takes place in an entirely new and mysterious location known as Anywhere City, which is oddly vague. Even stranger is the time period, as there seems to be a lot of confusion surrounding the topic, and DMA, now Rockstar themselves, haven't helped with that at all. Looking inside the manual, the first page has an odd quote about imagining the future, and yet the top line on the next page states that this game takes place only three weeks into the future, presumably from 1999, which is just strange. This mix of classical and technological advancements seen in the game create a retro-futuristic style, with the GTA 2 movie being filmed in 99 New York City only adding to this confusion. Developers wanted to keep the time period in this game rather ambiguous to allow for more creative freedom when it comes to design choices like architecture and technology that appears within the game. But at the end of the day, all that's really important that you need to know is that we're in a new city overrun by rival gangs, all warring over the different territory. But the icing on top is the evil Zaibotsu Corporation. They control everything in this place. They control the media, they control the drugs, the healthcare, the politicians, absolutely everything. And you do not want to cross them. Trust me. In each of the three areas of the game, three different gangs operate. From the rednecks and yakuza, to the scientists and Krishna monks, with Zaibotsu operating in all corners of the city. Keeping with the sandbox style, this game gives us the freedom from the very moment we start walking around of who we want to work for. Each gang has a set of missions varying in difficulty and completion reward, requiring you to be in good favour to access the more valuable missions. So for example, say you're working with the Yakuza and reach level 2 of respect as shown on the heads up display here in the top left. If you suddenly decide to go and complete some missions for their rivals, the crazed loony gang of druggies and insane asylum members, then the Yakuza are going to change their tune and cut you off until you re-earn your respect by gunning down their enemies. 
So there is an intense focus on maintaining a balance with your gang respect, and let me just say that I adore this. What an incredible setup for a GTA game, and such an advancement on the true open-ended sandbox nature of this franchise. This is a Grand Theft Auto experience that we have yet to see attempted at this level again. The only hypothetical scenario that I can conjure up to try and explain what this is like is, um, it's like San Andreas. Okay, imagine San Andreas, but instead of being automatically placed into the Grove Street Families gang and being at war with everyone else on the map, imagine if you started off as an outsider who could work for any one of the different gangs across the map. That's the kind of truly open GTA experience that, to this day, only really exists in Grand Theft Auto 2. But that's okay, because this is a lot of fun. While I still have trouble from time to time with pesky difficulty spikes in certain missions, it doesn't make me want to stop playing. The original game barred you from retrying failed missions, but here, you can try and try and try again until you complete them. Thank you. That makes it actually possible for the average player to get the most out of this experience and seeing everything on offer. On top of that, if you drop by a church, you can actually save your progress. Imagine that. What a high-tech feature. None of this grinding for millions of points in a single run. If you've got shit to do, then you can save and come back later on. At a cost to your bank account, of course. Everything costs money, and rightfully so. Modern Grand Theft Auto, after a certain point, the dollar signs mean absolutely nothing, and you could never blow it all, even if you tried. But in 2 here, we actually have things to spend money on. The usual pay and sprays, of course, but that's along with other vehicle modifications to give you the upper hand in more turbulent situations. Oil slicks and sensor mines to drop behind your vehicle, and even mounted weapons on the front. Yes, you can actually drive and shoot in this game, which is a godsend that drastically helps to balance out the difficulty at your own expense. Unfortunately, though, many of the other power-ups that we can find don't really help at all. Everything from invulnerability, invisibility, damage boosts, these things should all help you out, but you'll only ever seem to bump into them while exploring outside of missions. And they are restricted to a harsh time limit, meaning that they run out before you even get a chance to use them. If they'd stayed equipped indefinitely and only after taking a hit, then would count down to losing the ability, that would have been a much better way of doing it in my opinion. It would still maintain a level of challenge as you would play it safe trying not to take damage, but would allow for a larger grace period once shit hits the fan. Man, I can't count how many times I'd make it all the way through a really tough area only to get jumped by a wall of men at the end and lose a life. Kill Frenzies are a returning mode, which again, are used as a method of earning 1-ups. And no, you don't have to make a mad sprint across the map to find them. You just get the extra life, thank god. On top of that, there are also collectibles scattered all over the map as a reward, although these are sometimes easier to reach, and other times you've got to be a little more creative if you want to grab them. There is a much clearer distinction present here between the driving and on-foot gameplay, which is a nice upgrade. There are lots of missions that send you into certain locations to cause havoc that are very clearly laid out like a video game level, which are often highlights of the game. And for this reason, missions are far more memorable and actually stay with you once you've finished playing, which is definitely more than can be said for the original, which all just sort of blurs in together after a while. So with that said, GTA 2 is a lot more modern in the way that it tells its story during gameplay. There are no cutscenes this time around, but more interesting strings of dialogue and set pieces or events that stay with you, such as tricking out a fire truck to shoot fire, test driving a remote controlled taxi before sending it out to blow up enemy gang members, and even stealing an armoured tank from a military base. While nothing super groundbreaking, it's the way these tasks are presented and emphasised through dialogue which makes things feel more important. And speaking of the military, we can achieve a higher wanted level this time around. The first game only offered four stars, but now we can go all the way up to six, as this was the game which introduced the FBI and military into the mix. It's not too often that you see them, but my god, as soon as this type of artillery start appearing, you know you're fucked. 
the law enforcement are deadly in this game. Absolutely maniacal little buggers. Probably the hardest of all GTA police forces, if you ask me. Learning where the pay and spray locations are is key, and thank god each payphone where you receive jobs from is always supplied with additional health, armour, and weapons to give you a fighting chance. So my method of working through the game efficiently was to take things one gang at a time and keeping my resources in stock, completing as many of the missions as possible, sometimes all of them, and then you're already on your way to the next map. Or, if you choose, you do have the option to continue playing in an area for as long as you please, if you're still looking around for collectible items or want to see some of the other missions. But after moving on, there are still no cutscenes, like I mentioned. That's honestly one of the areas where this game critically lacks in my opinion. Without any story, there's no overarching purpose or encouragement to continue throughout the game. I mean, they filmed all of this fun live-action footage for the trailer. Could they not have shown off more of this within the actual game experience? Like, you know, say you piss off a rival gang and then you get a cutscene of them sending a hitman after you. That would actually be fun, but there's nothing like that here. In their place, however, between each stage, we can unlock these mini bonus rounds that don't seem to serve any great purpose, aside from a quick distraction. Racing around three laps for the fastest time, gunning down as many vehicles as possible. These are cute, but they offer nothing of interest at the end of the day. Out of the three maps here, I'd have to say that my favourite is the second one, following that trend where the game peaks a little too early and overstays its welcome. The first downtown area is mostly all city, while the final industrial zone is a weird fusion of ruined ghettos and religious temples. But the residential area offers the most variety, with your regular city streets, factory areas to explore both in your vehicle and on foot, but there is also a separate section which is home to the Zaibotsu Corporation, and then the Rednecks also have their own trailer park. I love the very clear, yet not over the top differences in the designs between between each gang and their space on the map. It helps you know where you are at all times. And this is important because the physical maps you get with GTA 2 are not worth the ink they're printed on. Look at this! It's so dark and so low resolution, how am I meant to keep track of where I'm going? The good news is that the maps are a little bit smaller, which makes them easier to digest the layout, so it's not as cumbersome to get anywhere once you know where all of the major highways and landmarks are. Alleyways and dead ends can still be a bit of a problem at times, but it's nowhere near as dire as the first game. So all in all, with so many different vehicles and pedestrians out on the streets, interacting with each other, and this sprawling world, everything feels so much more alive. And thank god something is alive, because I'm certainly not. With the brutal police force and a larger focus on footwork oriented missions now, meaning that you're exposed to all manner of gunfire, this is a difficult game. Not even close to London 1961, but man, I started to really struggle halfway through. Missions just seem to go on for too long and require far too much firepower. Sometimes we're given a crew of men to help us out, but I mean, they aren't even good at being meat shields because they die instantly. And there is very rarely any health or armor offered along mission paths. So, how the fuck am I meant to go into this huge ass facility, kill all of these guards, blow up these generators, walk down the street to another part of the facility crawling with more guards, walk along this narrow hallway to a dead end, and then be expected to fight my way back through another onslaught of guards without any assistance in such a cramped space? It gets a bit ridiculous, I won't lie. Skill issue, maybe, but challenge in my opinion should be linear, not a fucking ramp that Tony Hawk could do a McTwist on. You find yourself leaning heavily on kill frenzies to get enough lives so that you don't run out and have to load your last save. But even attempting these rampages isn't always as straightforward as they may seem. I think the biggest error here is how some of these missions are accessed. Like the Docklands, scattered throughout GTA 1, there are cranes all over the map which can be used to lift vehicles on or off of large trailers. Which, by the way, is pretty neat to see fully functioning semis in this game. It wouldn't be until San Andreas that we'd see this sort of towing mechanic again. 
But anyway, the problem is that some kill frenzies are activated by entering vehicles, many of which need to be taken off of these trailers to access first. So, it's a bit of an effort finding an appropriate truck to collect the trailer and then drive it to a crane across town and unload it. But it does make it feel more realistic and immersive, I suppose. But you do that, and then you complete your kill frenzy and go on about your gameplay as normal. Anyway, say for one reason or another, you have to save your game and come back to it later on. Which is when you discover that your save file has been bricked. Yes. This was a glitch that I was not expecting to encounter during my playthrough of this game, and as soon as I realised what had happened, I felt so discouraged from wanting to play any further. Which is such a shame, because even though I was struggling, I was still enjoying my time with the experience. I was having fun, and I didn't want it to end there. The reason this happens is so stupid. Because these vehicles spawn onto trailers, the game doesn't know what to do with the car when you load a save file, as it's not supposed to be accessible anymore. So it gets wiped from the map, but the game then gets confused and doesn't know how to do that, and then just decides to crash over and over. I mean, that's the civilian explanation anyway. I'm not a GTA scientist by any means. But what a disaster! I mean, the odds of you accidentally stumbling into this are overwhelming, and with only a single save slot in the game, you would be fucked. Up shit creek. You would have to start the entire map over again, which is potentially hours of playtime lost. And that is just unforgivable in my book. Man. Bless the fans and modding communities, whom have created a fix that spawns these cars detached from the trailers, fixing this problem. Meaning there's no more having to do all that pissing about to access the missions in the first place, but more importantly, there's no more pesky glitches bricking my damn game. By the time all of this was resolved and I started messing about on the final map, to be completely honest, I was hesitant to try too hard at finishing this thing. Look, I enjoyed most of my time with it despite some difficulty, but I wanted to leave the game with positive memories, not negative ones. Everything generally seemed to ramp up with the difficulty here. Stronger police efforts, longer, more complex missions, and encountering a lot of awkward situations, and a few other minor issues and glitches starting to pile up. Coming off of what I'd consider the peak of this game, with nothing at the end of the rainbow for me when I was finished, I messed around for a little bit and decided to end my time with the game a little early. Grand Theft Auto 2 is a solid title. It's by no means perfect, nor would I expect it to be, but it greatly built upon those early foundations, implementing staples of the franchise and the entire open world genre to come. Larger selections of weapons, a balanced mix of play styles, more detailed missions, a lot more side activities and interaction with the world, gang territories and vehicle modifications. There is so much to be thankful for here. But having said that, it's what missing that gets me the most. There's no well-established characters, no focused story, nothing worth your effort to make it through. This one somehow feels even more like an arcade title than the first game, just something that you'd pop in and mess around with until you're bored, instead of the type of game that you'd actually want to play through, if you get what I mean. Mm, it's a hard call, but I believe that GTA 2 deserves a 7 out of 10. Now, I was leaning a bit lower after encountering that glitch, but I just can't deny the huge leaps forward made by this game. My gripes aside, I would still definitely recommend that you give this game a go, because it is a lot of fun, and even when compared to the earlier 3D titles of the franchise, this has a lot of content to offer, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, that's what I think of GTA 2. But before we go anywhere... <laughs> Before we go anywhere, let's quickly take a look at the Game Boy Color port. Yes, another drastic demake of a DMA classic.
Alright, so... This game fucking sucks. <laughs> Obviously next to the original, but hey, the first GTA on Game Boy was passable, for the most part. This one is very similar, but my god, it somehow plays so much worse. Cars and general movement is so damn stiff. I mean, the game runs slower to begin with, but touching anything stops you dead in your tracks, allowing cops to easily nab you, or just blindly open fire like bloody Rambo or some shit. These police officers, by the way, look at them. They wear their little sirens on top of their heads. Man, that's so funny. Fucking go-go gadget. Wee-woo, wee-woo, wee-woo. And the fact that they tried to implement a similar level of on-foot gameplay just creates large areas where nothing is going on. And when you die, I, I hope that's not a photo of a real corpse. Man, and people say Nintendo is for kids. Well everyone, that is GTA 2, ending off my trilogy of videos on the classic Grand Theft Auto games. I went into this looking to find out if these were worth playing today, and look, now that I have played them all for myself, I'm genuinely glad that I've had the experience. Did I get a whole lot out of it? Not really, besides some of the set pieces and improvements in number two, along with just the general intrigue seeing the origins of one of my favourite franchises. At the very least, I would recommend the second game to people because it is a fun time once you adjust to the older format, just don't expect it to be the most groundbreaking thing you've ever played. Grand Theft Auto would eventually return to this style of games in 2009 with Chinatown Wars. And if you'd like to learn more about that, then go check out this video over on Color Shed Productions' channel. Uh, he does an excellent review of the game, I highly recommend it. Um, as for me, I do plan on covering all of the 3D Grand Theft Auto games in the future, but for now, I want to take a break and focus on some other things. So until then, I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and remember to share with your friends on social media. I'm Square Eye Jack, and I hope you have a great fucking day. Thanks for watching.